Hi, I'm Megan Daniels. I'm assistant professor of ancient Greek material culture at the University of British Columbia and a proud member of the Peopling the Past team. And this is Peopling the Past. What topic are you talking about today? While my research focuses mainly on the ancient Greek world, I've had long-standing interests in Phoenician history and culture as well. Both the ancient Greeks and Phoenicians migrated far and wide around the Mediterranean world in the early first millennium BCE. And since one of my main interests in studying the ancient Mediterranean is understanding how people migrated, interacted and integrated with one another, I found it impossible to ignore the Phoenicians. And the Phoenician homeland lies in the coastal Levant and around the important port cities like Tyre, Sidon, Byblos and Beirut. I'm using the term Phoenician for simplicity's sake, but it's important to note that there was no singular nation in antiquity called Phoenicia, nor was there a singular group of people who referred to themselves as Phoenicians. And in fact, our modern term comes from the Greek name Phoenix, that was generally applied to peoples who came from this, from this general region. What we do know from archaeological sources, inscriptions, and literary sources is that, is that people from this region started early in the first millennium BCE, settling around Cyprus, the coasts of North Africa, southern Spain, um, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, the Balearic Islands, and all the way out to the Atlantic coast as well, on the coasts of, of Morocco and Spain. In literary sources like Homer's epics, they had reputations as being seafarers and traders of luxury goods, and in some cases were known to be greedy tricksters. Uh, in fact, so much of what we know of the Phoenicians comes from Greek, Roman, and Hebrew literary sources, and so it's really vital to illuminate the lives and histories of the Phoenicians, uh, particularly through archaeological fieldwork. In my research, I've mainly been interested in the Phoenicians' interactions with the Greeks and Romans, as all of these diverse groups migrated around the Mediterranean world. My main line of research is how people found common ground with one another in migratory and colonial ceremonies through, uh, through religion, and how religious belief and ritual was a facilitator of cross-cultural interaction. Certainly we might be inclined in the modern world to see uh, religion as something that's exclusive, perhaps even divisive, but in the ancient polytheistic Mediterranean, religion, and particularly the gods, seem to be incredibly translatable across cultural and regional boundaries. What sources or data do you look at? My research is focused on two main areas. The first is the god hero that we typically know as Hercules in the Latin language or Heracles in the Greek language. And most people will be familiar with Hercules and Heracles, but few know of their counterpart in the Phoenician language and culture, which is Melkart. Melkart was the Phoenician god worshiped in the city of Tyre. And you also had a famous temple established all the way out to the end of the Mediterranean at the mouth of the Atlantic at the ancient city of Gadir, modern day Cadiz. From literary sources like Herodotus, we know that the Greeks saw Melkart as the older and more venerable version of their hero, Heracles. Now, I study the relationship between these gods through literary sources and also religious iconography using figurines and images and iconography and later coins to understand the traditions of the Greeks, Phoenicians, Romans, and others of this famous wandering hero who slew monsters, who accomplished superhuman tasks, and who eventually was made a god and brought up to Olympus. I'm interested especially in how people related to the idea of a wandering monster slaying god hero, since the imageries and stories of Hercules were so ubiquitous around the Mediterranean. And I especially focus on the Phoenician contribution to this tradition, from the classic imagery of this hero with his club and his lion skin cloak, to the myths that had Hercules wander to the ends of the known world, i.e. the Atlantic, um, accomplishing once again his, his great feats uh, and slaying of monsters. We tend to locate Hercules firmly in the Greco-Roman worlds, but true to his nature as a hero who wandered to the ends of the earth, he was a hero for so many diverse peoples around the Mediterranean world. I also study Phoenician settlements in North Africa to see how people from different cultures lived together in colonial and migratory scenarios. From 2013 to 2015, I was part of an archaeological excavation that investigated a Phoenician settlement in southern Tunisia called Zita, near the modern-day town of Jarzis and the island of Jerba. Zita was a domestic, religious, and industrial site producing metals, 
olive oil, pottery, salt, and possibly also fish paste. The settlement was established as early as the 6th century BCE by Phoenician migrants and was later the site of a Roman town starting in the 1st century CE. At the time of the Roman settlement, the Romans had long since conquered and destroyed the powerful Phoenician city of Carthage and had slowly incorporated many parts of North Africa into the Roman Empire. So this site lets us see how Phoenician, Roman, indigenous North Africans and foreign traders lived and interacted in one place. Areas of this site that were investigated include the Roman town center, the, the forum, established in the first century CE, and Phoenician domestic areas that were later converted to industrial metal producing areas under the Roman occupation, and a Phoenician sanctuary that was in use both before and after the Roman occupation. And you can see a, an image of the excavations in process here. I was part of a team studying the pottery that emerged from domestic, industrial, and religious areas in order to reconstruct human activities at these areas, and importantly, uh, establish dates for different areas of occupation based on the forms and styles of different types of pottery that were found. Pottery is virtually indestructible in the archaeological record, and its forms tend to change uh, over time as fashions change. So it's a good method for establishing the chronology of a site. There were many other aspects of the site that were examined, including the faunal remains or the animal bones, uh, plant remains, architecture, and other artifacts such as remains of religious dedications at the sanctuary. And in fact, even before excavating the sanctuary, over 600 remains of upright stone dedications, what we call stelae, were found on the surface of this site. How can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? Both the study of Hercules, Heracles, and Melkart, and the excavations at Zeta can illuminate the history of peoples who had such a significant impact on ancient Mediterranean history, but who are often sidelined by modern day interests in Greeks and Romans. The Phoenicians were often portrayed as the arch enemies of Romans in literary sources, especially because Rome and Carthage fought a series of wars in the third and second centuries BCE, known as the Punic Wars. The Phoenicians were also vilified for their religious practices like infant sacrifice. And these stereotypes have persisted into modern day. Uh, for example, Italian director uh, Giovanni Prestrone's 1914 film Kibiria tells the story of a Sicilian girl uh, captured by Carthaginian pirates and chosen to be sacrificed to their gods. Uh, and earlier, Gustave Flaubert's 1862 novel Salambeau tells the story of the mercenary revolt at Carthage in the third century BCE and the ill-fated love between the Carthaginian priestess Salambeau and a, a Libyan mercenary. And these depictions tended to push the Phoenicians into kind of a strange and exotic world outside of our own world for us to marvel at and be both intrigued and horrified by their quote-unquote savage cultural practices. So in addition to being cast as the bad guys in the story of Rome, it's often assumed that the Romans essentially stamped out Phoenician cultural and religious practices as the Roman Empire expanded into North Africa. And the general idea that Roman culture overrode local culture, cultural practices was a process often referred to as Romanization. Our work at Zeta provides a much clearer picture of the Phoenician peoples who settled around the Mediterranean. It's shown that many local practices continued long after Roman occupation. For example, an analysis of animal bones shows that local diet, based largely on sheep and goat, remained largely consistent, despite the earlier belief that Romans introduced new dietary practices into the region. Religious practices at the sanctuary also continued well after the Roman town was established, uh, based on the pottery that was used in the sanctuary. This work thus allows us to see better how diverse peoples actually live together in the face of migration, and show that culture persisted despite Roman imperial conquest. It also helps us just understand better the day-to-day -day life, including what made up local diet, as well as other religious and cultural practices of the Phoenicians, who had such a significant impact in general in the ancient Mediterranean world. So I'd like to thank you for listening today. Once again, I'm Megan Daniels. This is Peopling the Past, and for more videos, podcasts, and blogs, please visit us at www.peoplingthepast.com. Thank you.